formal lectures and, and tutorials. Um, I think your Facebook page, Build Me, has been here to defend this syllabus, whatever that might mean. Um, I've got 15 minutes, I couldn't even describe this syllabus for all the various programs that we teach in, in 15 minutes. So what I'll do is I'll try and um, make some uh, remarks under, under these headings which relate to, to undergraduate university uh, education in economics. And, and what, what, some of what I say is, is going to relate to Manchester, but some of it's going to be a bit more general, I guess. Um, I'd like to start by just addressing the question of, of fitness for purpose, because that's the, that's the title of tonight's event. And as Jonathan said, I mean, if we were really taking this seriously, we'd delve into the philosophical and various other uh, implications of, of what that actually means, of what does fit for purpose actually mean. But I'm an economist, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to um, dive straight in and look at the market and uh, look at some data uh, from the market. So, so what does fitness for purpose mean for, from that perspective? Well, here's some earnings by degree subject. Uh, these data are a little bit old now, but you can see that economics uh, scores third best or third highest behind uh, health degrees and law degrees in, in the UK labour market, so <coughs> both men and women. So there's a very, very high markup for economics degrees, which does suggest that um, First of all, it suggests you've chosen to do the right programme if you study in economics. But it also suggests that there is some kind of demand for the skills that economists have, that there is some fitness for purpose there. Some more data from uh, Manchester Social Science subjects, which is much more up to date. Uh, and I've got data on, um, from the key information set data, which is available to all university applicants now. Uh, and I've got some data on the percentage in further worker study six months after graduation of people from various programmes here at Manchester, the percentage of those who are, uh, the percentage of those employed who are in professional managerial occupations, and then their average salaries. And you can see that the Bachelor of Economic Science uh, does extremely well. It's in the top 10 in the UK. And I'll take two things from this. First of all, if we're talking about the fitness and purpose of disciplines, well, maybe some of the other disciplines, actually, we should be looking at them before we look at economics. Uh, and the second thing uh, I would take from this is that somebody somewhere out there thinks that our economics graduates are actually fit for purpose because they're highly in demand in the labour market. So any, any you know, comments that we raise about fitness and purpose I think have to deal with, with that. Right, the second um, thing that I wanted to raise uh, was... Um, have I changed that? Yeah, I've changed that. I've, so I've changed the title of the section so I'm confusing myself. And I'm um, messing up the slides as well. Um, the second, second heading that I wanted to, to raise was just, well, let's hear it for the mainstream. That's, that's the title of my second uh, section. And I've, got some, I've got some examples here of, of mainstream economic research, which uh, I think um, maybe uh, rebuts some of the criticisms that are, that are often made. I mean, some of the criticisms that are made of the mainstream, it's narrow, it's blinkered, it's close to new ideas or outside influences. The discipline and wider society suffer as a result. Some people argue that the adherence of the mainstream to an, uh, a rigid set of precepts, assumptions and modes of analysis makes economics irrelevant to the real world, incapable of conversing with other disciplines and of questionable value to decision makers faced with satisfying multiple objectives in a complex world. Sorry for the long sentence. Um, I think here's, you know, here's some examples which I think um, kind of address that. Uh, this is the, the, the first and highest profile is, is Al Roth, who's um, very mathematical game theoretic work <coughs> on matching algorithms has been applied in a, in a number of different contexts, including matching school teachers to, um, to schools, uh, matching, sorry, matching prospective students to schools, matching newly qualified doctors to the hospitals where they're going to do their internships, but of course most famously uh, matching kidney donors and, and, and patients needing transplants. And he, the BBC report here uh, says that Roth's work is keeping hundreds, perhaps thousands of people alive, uh, basically using sort of game theory, theoretic algorithms. Uh, much closer to home, my colleague, Professor Rachel Griffith. Uh, you'll have seen her, some of you will have seen her uh, last week, talking at one of our Economics Extra staff student seminar series, uh, meetings about her work on alcohol pricing, specifically motivated by policy proposals designed to improve public health outcomes. Uh, Rachel uses scanner data, which um, monitors uh, households' purchasing decisions. Uh, and basically using econometric estimates of simple concepts of elasticity of demand, she, she, she finds that um, a minimum alcohol price of 45 pence per unit reduces alcohol consumption by around 19% on average, but transfers 710 million pounds from uh, consumers to producers. So, you know, um, 
highly engaged kind of, uh, kind of work. Uh, the third example, um, and sorry for the advertising, uh, Richard Aginor next week is going to speak at our next Economics Extra event on the 18th of March, 12.15, Mansfield Cooper G21. Uh, why gender inequality matters? Richard's work here, again, uh, you can see some of his, um, some of his, his, his work there. It's highly, highly theoretical, mathematical work, but um, focused then on, on really important policy issues. Um, he, he's looking at how uh, macro and gender interact. Uh, his, his, his model, which is based on an overlapping generations framework, suggests that subsidised childcare, a reduction in gender discrimination in the workplace, and improvements in the bargaining power of women in the household can all have positive impacts on economic growth, which are very clear policy implications for the kind of developing countries that, that Richard works on. So, why am I showing you these things? Well, I'm showing you these things because um, they are um, they're all examples of the kinds of things that mainstream economists do. Uh, there's two micro examples, one macro example. There's various mixtures of theoretical and empirical work in there. But between them they cover a wide range of economic behaviour. They're of huge interest and relevance to policymakers, and they have the potential to improve human welfare. Does this suggest a discipline which is narrow? Does this suggest a discipline which is unable to communicate with decision makers? Does this suggest a discipline which is nothing to say to the wider world? Well, clearly not. Okay. So, um, the, um, yeah, so there's other, I mean, there's other examples of how I think you, know, you can claim, that you, can, you can say that the mainstream is open to change and open to interaction between itself and other disciplines. Perhaps principle amongst those is the fruitful contribution, uh, the fruitful collaboration <coughs> between economists and psychologists, which has resulted in the, uh, the rise of behavioural economics, which is um, a field of study within economics which explicitly starts off from the idea that people do make mistakes compared to the, the rational kind of framework that, that Paul Ormerod was talking about uh, a few minutes ago. So um, I think that the mainstream of the discipline, which is what most economists do wherever they're working, what the vast majority of departments teach, it gets a bad press sometimes, but I think there's plenty of evidence that it's actually in good health and it's something that you should want to study and, and want to get into and understand and perhaps even work in at some point. Right, um, so that's my second heading. Um, sorry, how am I doing for time, Zach? You've got seven minutes left. Good, thank you. Um, the, the third thing I wanted to talk about was um, just... Uh, I, I thought I'd try and directly address some of the, the, the comments and the criticisms that are made in the petition which the Post-Crash Society has now posted on their, their Facebook page. I don't know how many of you have seen it, but I, I had a look at it. Uh, and I thought it would be appropriate for me to try and address some of these things maybe particularly from a, Man from a Manchester uh, perspective. Um, one thing that, that the post-crash society are, are interested in is the idea that there's, there's not enough critical thinking uh, going on in, in economics modules, that this isn't being encouraged or rewarded enough. And um, I, 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 know, I, find, I, I kind of find that, um, I find that difficult to believe because economists are very critical. I work amongst them all the time. Uh, but but it, it, I think part of the problem is that um, it's, part, it's kind of the perspective. This is a, a, a problem of the perspective that some of our students have uh, on their studies, and that perspective is based on, on which year they're in and what kind of programme uh, they're actually studying. Um, for example, I don't tend to find that third-year single honours economic students voice the same kind of criticism. They don't actually voice the criticism that they're not being encouraged to take a critical perspective uh, in their studies. And I think you know, part of the problem is that um, uh, it may be a byproduct of the fact that our curriculum has to accommodate students from a wide, a wide variety of backgrounds and we're taking a, a, a range of different kinds of programmes. So, for example, to ensure that third year specialists have the appropriate background to take a, a range of options in third year, second year core micro and macro uh, tend to cover a, a, a lot of fairly dry formal kind of material. It's very important stuff, it's the backbone of the single honour study in, 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 um, in economics, but it can involve learning the intricacies of a lot of models with relatively little discussion of the underlying assumptions or the potential applications uh, of those models. Uh, and the problem is that, that non-specialists, such as those on joint honours programmes or PPA, may find themselves doing those core modules and not much economics, uh, not much economics besides. So this is their whole exposure to economics and all they see is, is this kind of approach. Uh, so there's potential solutions to that which could be explored and which we may well be exploring. Uh, but I think you know, there's a kind of sense in which there's no getting away from the fact that if you want to do economics, 
this is the kind of material that in some sense you have to slog through when, in, when, you're, in, uh, when you're in year two. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah, so, so, there, the, the, thanks. Yeah, so there is that. There, there, there is that. Um, the second thing uh, that I wanted to say here, which is, is actually the third thing on my list, uh, is that there's an element here when we are learning about these models of, of, of critical <coughs> thinking built into that. Um, and um, learning economics is as much about learning a certain way of thinking about the world is it, as it is about learning about models which are of direct applicability to particular economic problems. Economics teaches people to think like an economist. For example, the ISLM model, ISLM model in the curriculum has been the subject of a lot of recent debate um, involving no less than Paul Krugman and others. Um, the, the debate is largely focused on the usefulness of the model for policy purposes, but in fact I think there's, there's, some, there's another point here which is worth making. It's that model is a perfect example of what we should be teaching at second year level. It's just simple enough to challenge students to start to think about how economists use mathematical models to understand the economy, but also just sophisticated enough to provide some insight on real world issues. Um, on one level, it may seem that students are being asked to accept a lot of assumptions without question, but a thorough understanding of this kind of model is part of a process of building up a set of skills which enable budding economists to start to think critically about how different parts of the economy are connected and how the logic of formal economic models drives their results. So that's a long sentence, but if there's one takeaway message from, from what I'm saying here, it's, it's that one. And the message is basically, you know, learn things like the ISLM model, it's good for you, and it'll help you to think like an economist. Okay, um, another claim that's made is that um, economics excludes alternative sources, uh, schools of thought, it excludes alternative perspectives on economics. Um, one thing that I want to uh, make clear is that, because it's not clear from the petition that, that people understand this, but one thing that I do want to make clear is that it's, it, it's not the case that we don't do any of that kind of thing at Manchester at all. Um, in fact, um, in all three years, there is the scope to actually study or have exposure to alternative approaches uh, to the mainstream. And in fact, my, um, my colleague Nick Weaver, who's here tonight, uh, tells me that our BCon sci students in first year study all of these all of these people, I won't, um, I won't run through their names, some you will recognise, uh, some you won't, but it's a list of, you know, it's an impressive list of uh, economists, not all of whom we would uh, necessarily describe as being mainstream or near classical <coughs> or anything like that. But the other point I'd like to make is that um, it is true that exposure to alternative schools has declined since I entered the profession, but that happens in all disciplines. All disciplines uh, change, economics is not, is not different. Theories which have been highly influential in the past fade from view to be replaced with others. Uh, sometimes old theories make a comeback. Um, to sort of give you, a, to give you a, a sense of perspective on that, I thought I'd, I'd think about a different discipline. I thought I'd think about medicine. And um, here are some theories which were once influential in mainstream medical education, but are a lot less influential now. So we've got the application of leeches for headaches. We've got my favorite, the tobacco smoke enema. Uh, I think the title says everything you need to know about that. And then homeopathy. Okay, so perhaps, you know, the reason that your particular favourite non-mainstream theory is not on the curriculum is because it's, it's gone the way of one of these, which are three different things. I mean, perhaps it's, perhaps it's uh, discredited. I'm not sure what it is. I think you've probably just read the caption, have you? Um, so, you know, it's, it's either been discredited like the, the, the tobacco smoke enema, or it's a contested, contested ground like homeopathy. Uh, or, like leeches, it's actually made a comeback because leeches are now actually um, you know, used again to help people who've got wounds which are difficult to clot. Okay, um, final point then. Um, having said all of what I've said, I think it's a very good time to be having this conversation. And Jonathan is a member of this steering group, which is the Economics After the Crisis um, uh, steering group. Uh, there's a, a, a great, a large number of people the great and the good of the profession uh, on this. Interestingly, no students on it, but um, maybe that's something they'll fix in the future. And um, that, that committee, um, as, as Jonathan said, is uh, deliberating and trying to come up with a, um, a set of recommendations. Uh, they haven't done that yet, but I have been given a sneak preview of, of the likely set of recommendations. So I've put them up here. And you can see that uh, Number two there in particular would seem to be very much in line with what the post-crash society is actually, uh, is actually uh, talking about. Uh, let me finish off by saying a little bit about Manchester's um, position in all of this. 
our department has, um, for a number of years now, had very high student-staff ratios, and I think it's fair to say that that has constrained, in some ways, what we'd like to be doing in terms of our uh, economic curriculum. The university has invested very heavily in our department. Um, we'll be making at least 14 permanent appointments over the period of time there. Not all new appointments, some will be replacing people who've retired or, or moved on. But as part of the process of deciding what to do with those resources, we have launched an undergraduate um, curriculum review. And some of those kinds of things that we're talking about, are, we're, we're talking about trying to make perhaps the, the provision uh, for specialists and non-specialists a little more distinctive, which might go some way towards uh, dealing with some of the issues that, that have been raised. We're going to put on new modules, for example, in behavioural economics. We've discussed, we've talked about putting on um, modules in alternative perspectives, alternative schools of thought and economics. And basically what we do is certainly going to be informed by the COIL statements. When, when, when that kind of group of people gets together, then you know, university departments have to sit up and take note. Uh, it's going to be informed by the petition, which I know is coming. It's, it's on Facebook now. Uh, and it's going to be informed by a wider consultation exercise with our students. So again, um, let me just say thank you very much for inviting me. I hope this is the start of a constructive and meaningful uh, conversation and dialogue. Uh, which will lead to an improvement in economics education at Manchester. Thank you. So thank you very much to Ken. Okay, we're now going to be taking questions. We're going to take them three at a time, and then each speaker will answer all three at once. Um, and depending on how many of they are, what they want to say. Please keep them as brief as possible. We want to get as many in, and um, I don't want to cut you off because I don't like being rude. So yeah, who would like to ask questions? Jonathan Lee, if you want to take up anything in that that you've managed to do, you've got to use this microphone. 
Okay. Well, no, just very quickly on the first, on the first uh, question, you're absolutely right. It has, there is a problem, I think, of privacy uh, of analysis. I think it, it uh, no, that has a number of different sources, but I think one of them is the way in which economics has um, posed as a science. Uh, and, uh, and I think even you know, very distinguished uh, traditional figures within the field, Greg Mankiw comes to mind. Um, and that he had a, yeah, just to give you a quote, he said, macroeconomics was born not as a science, but more as a type of engineering. God put macroeconomists on earth not to propose and test elegant theories, but to solve practical problems. <coughs> and, uh, and I think there is a sense in which we, we lost sight of that. We lost sight of that, that we, you know, we know that it's, it's quite a nice way to start off in an economics course to talk about the mathematically sophisticated <coughs> models we have, the data we use, the sophisticated statistical techniques we use to, to test that in a way that conveys a kind of neutrality of a scientific you know, finding, which is really misleading because uh, they're all, they're not only uh, are data always going to be inadequate to, to fully resolve issues because of the dynamic changing nature of the economy, the reflexive nature of the agents in the economy, um, but even when we, when we purport to test something which seems to be simple, the assumptions we make are numerous. That is, we, we, in, in economics, we are always testing very complex joint hypotheses without actually being very specific about that. And so we make claims for causal relations that actually are not justified by, by the kinds of tests we're doing. So I think it, it is something, this primacy has probably been, been um, facilitated by our ability to fool a bunch of people into thinking uh, that, that we're assigned in a way that really is, is not appropriate. Yeah, we come to the story I, I agree with that. Um, I think in the case of the welfare reforms, the economics is actually in second place um, by comparison to political expediency, political ideology, call it something like that. Uh, it may even be in, uh, it, it ought to be in third place, where ethics should be in second place. Um, but the um, the idea that economics is neutral, which is the essence of, of your point, neutral and scientific, uh, is a rather pernicious myth when it comes to applications of this kind of quantity. Um, then there was your question. Um, we've been cautioned in recent years uh, not to say neoclassical, because neoclassical economics is morphing in ways which are difficult to trace. So I use the word mainstream instead. Um, and there's no doubt that if they put their minds to it, neoclassical economists could talk about finance. Um, it's just that, you know, they've talked about it in a particular way up to now, uh, which has been rather unhelpful, shall we say. Uh, and I hope I just touched on that enough to, to, to give a flavor of it. Um, as for where to start, um, one of the difficulties that anybody who has uh, an interest in heterodox economics finds is that the starting point is always, call it neoclassical or call it mainstream, I'm not too clear, but ordinary textbook economics. And by the time they get to one's heterodox economics course, their brains are full of what Keynes called contrary notions. Um, and it's very difficult then to get them lay those aside and say, well, there might be another way of looking at this. In other words, the, the, the beginning is hugely important. And the way it's very often taught, not always, but very often, is, is doctrinaire. It's, it's a kind of indoctrination. <coughs> uh, the intention 
is to fill the brain with these contrary notions. So that other ways of looking at economics are very difficult to insert <coughs> into those brains. Um, teaching in a pluralist way is very difficult and delicate. But there is no particular reason why one special case should be the ground floor of economic knowledge. Uh, privileged over others. It is one approach amongst many. It just happens to be uh, that favored by most economics departments all over the world. Uh, and that is because it perpetuates itself in exactly this kind of way. Uh, now, Paul, <coughs> um, yeah, yeah, just uh, respond to the, the question here. Well, I'm very pleased that uh, Economics is starting to be taught at Manchester, that's good. Uh, but Daniel Kahneman got his Nobel Prize in 2002, about 10 years ago. Uh, so you think, you know, maybe physics is somebody who wins a Nobel Prize, uh, the, the, the results are obviously immediately absorbed into the mainstream. We don't wait until an outside committee also. So if you may have done it endogenously, so that's good. You know, so, uh, uh, so that's, that's fine. Um, and on the question of thinking about, um, about macroeconomics, um, should it be these models were fundamentally played a fundamental role in the crisis? Now, Olivier Blanchard, uh, the chief economist from the IMF, published a discussion paper at the end of 2008 called The States of Macroeconomic Theory. And it relates to something that Ken was saying. He then surveyed, I mean, certainly 40 years ago, there were contending schools within academic macro. But he's, the, the thrust of his article was to say, uh, the, 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 head, the, the other ones have been eliminated and the mainstream based dynamics to plastic general equilibrium prevailed uh, because it was scientifically superior. And he concluded at the end of August 2008 that the state of macroeconomic theory was good. Now we don't have to be economic historians to remember that in the middle of September of that year, Lehman Brothers collapsed. Um, so uh, the, there, are, there are points there. Now of course, um, I was very careful to say, I think the mainstream economics is not wrong, it's a special case rather than a general case. And of course, um, uh, standard theory can accommodate any phenomenon by ex simply expanding arguments in the utility function uh, indefinitely. Uh, I'm really talking about a different approach and the use of, say, different mathematics. Because what becomes important uh, once we allow for endogenous practices, don't regard them as a special case. Uh, and how to take <coughs> signals from others in terms of altering their practices um, is who influences who, who is connected to who. And we need a different branch of mathematics being very highly developed, uh, and people who like hard maths will find plenty of it for them, I can assure you, uh, called graph theory, uh, which economists are simply not taught. What are the, and this is a fundamental importance to the model. Think about the internet, struck the internet, who influences people on the internet, how do you capture information off that? There's a whole range of things which uh, standard theory doesn't uh, incorporate. Um, so I'm not saying you can throw it all away, uh, but say teach it as a special case and look at the empirical world and see what, what, what does that correspond to. I would teach that from the outset. I would teach simulation techniques uh, from the outset with alternative rules of behavior. Ken, do you want to add anything? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, uh, the question here, I think, um, the, the idea of the primacy of economics kind of appeals to me as economists, but I don't think they're using it in that kind of positive sort of way. Um, I mean, my attitude to that question is really that policy made by policy makers, and if they're using some particular theory to justify that policy, then that's, that's the choice of making. You know, you know, you can't, can't blame the discipline in a sense for that. Just like I don't think we can blame the discipline for the crisis, you know, something might like to try that. If we're going to try and, you know, if we're going to policy, economic policy is made by economic policy makers. If we're going to blame economics for uh, the financial crisis or for you know, the benefit policy, then are we also going to give it credit for the fact that real wages in the UK are 65% higher than they were 25 years ago? You can't, you can't pick and choose. So if you, if you, the job of policy makers is to, um, is to make policy and to be held responsible for, for the decisions that we make. Um, on behavioural economics, the question that's uh, that was up there, um, uh, not next year, sadly, but, but possibly the year after. Uh, and, and, um, various, various issues to be, uh, to be considered, um, as you can imagine. Um, and maybe just to pick up what Paul was saying there about the length of time that it does take for 
new developments in, in research to, to find their way onto the economics undergraduate curriculum. I would agree that, that, that there is a, a communication problem in economics, but it can take a very, very long time for research to, um, to become, to, to get published. And one of the reasons that it's taken so long to respond to the crisis, I think, is that um, you know, it, can, it can be five years just from starting a piece of research to actually getting it published in a peer-reviewed academic journal, which is the sort of the mark of quality of, of academic research and economics. So if you think that the, that the crisis only actually started about five years ago, it's not really any surprise that we are not seeing things changing in textbooks or, 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 or grammar um, yet. But I'm sure it will. I'm sure that the, the, um, the textbooks will change. I'm sure that the financial sector will become incorporated into macroeconomic models. It's just that by the time we get round to that, it might be a completely different kind of crisis. Can everyone hear without the mics, and do we need speakers to speak into the mics? Just check. Can you hear the back over there? Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Um, we have three more questions then. Okay, yeah. So um, for the recording sake, we'll speak into the mics now that the okay, speakers. Um, so three more questions. So yeah, if we go from one up the back in the corner there. Um, yeah, we'll go, we can go three over there, to be honest. So yeah, so if we start with... Um, uh, yeah, it's just kind of continuing on the rules point, and I think it's um, some of what I'm getting from what Jonathan was saying. It's this idea that uh, a lot of things are being synthesised, that's what economists are being asked to do. And um, is uh, a major part of the problem the fact that um, like trying to use constant physics to describe everyday life, but they're actually just being stretched far beyond um, their limits. And people are going basically uh, way beyond what models can be expected to describe. I suppose the, uh, the popular uh, comparison would be uh, making a comparison between uh, a household and the economy at large. Um, so yeah, this is what the speaker source is. Uh, to the blue jumper. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm a senior lecturer in physics, and I work on complex systems. Uh, so very much in the spirit of the Paul. And um, so my question is: so, so we, we are more or less constantly being approached by the faculty of life sciences, and they see the need to have input from physics and disciplines like physics. And we co-supervise PhD students. And we've run you know, so many workshops and things. Um, so my question is, is there a scope sort of for non-economists to be involved in the teaching of new approaches to economics? Uh, that's a question for Paul and I think the head of uh, economics, because I know that Paul has written papers on worrying trends in economics, uh, in econophysics, has criticized physicists uh, entering the field. So I'm not proposing that a physicist does it on their own, but maybe jointly. Uh, the, the university college has been mentioned. Do people see a, a way forward? Okay, we come to the person behind for the last question. Um, my question is to Ken Clark. Um, so you mentioned that uh, pure economic students, uh, you haven't got complaints from them about the lack of critical theory and critical analysis within, within economics. So my question is, um, do you not think that this is um, actually indicative of the problem? Um, so, for instance, I've, I've asked questions to um, economics lectures which like challenge like the assumptions assumptions of mainstream economics, and I've got responses from them which include things like, um, "Oh, so you're a PPE student, are you?" <laughs> <laughs> so there shouldn't be this assumption from from economics lecturers that when a student critically engages with the material, that they're not a pure economic student. So the way in which economic students